chapter 20, allergic reactions. So we don't run into too many severe anaphylactic reactions in the field. Uh, we do get called from time to time to you know poor reactions for medication and stuff like that. But when we do have those severe reactions, um, they are in fact exactly that, severe. And they require prompt identification, um, immediate treatment, and a rapid transport. These things can really be challenging for patients, especially with those that have anaphylactic reactions. So generally speaking, an allergic reaction is an exaggerated response. Something in the body, uh, some type of allergen, gets into the body, triggers that immune response, and that immune response just goes way overboard, right? Our body has an immune system specifically to fight against uh, foreign bodies, to fight against uh, disease and illness and that type of stuff. So our immune system is really valuable. However, from time to time, the, the immune system identifies something as an allergen, or in this case as a threat, and it attacks it, even though it really shouldn't be a threat to us. You know, examples being, of course, things like bee stings and peanuts and certain medications and that type of stuff. So um, anytime that an allergen gets into a body, into the body, it can trigger that exaggerated immune response and it can cause some pretty significant issues for our patient. So as the exposures begin to occur, right, a an allergic reaction never occurs on the first exposure there has to be a first exposure in order for the immune system to build up the antibodies to that allergen. Now from there, you could be exposed to that same allergen 500 times in life and never have a response. And then all of a sudden exposure 501, you have a significant response. Conversely, you could be exposed to it just that first time, build up the antibodies, and then the second exposure you have to it is a massive anaphylactic response. It really just depends depends on the allergen, it depends on the body, it depends on a lot of individual factors. So what I'm trying to say with that is that we can't simply say, well, the patient's never had an anaphylactic reaction, so therefore it can't be an anaphylactic reaction. That's absolutely not the case. We can't say, well, the patient's been exposed to shellfish you know, 500 times in life, so there's no way it could be an allergic reaction to shellfish when in fact it most certainly can be, okay? So we really have to have an, a heightened index of suspicion when it comes to allergic reactions, and we can't get caught being complacent with these things. All right, so uh, here you go. The antibodies now exist after the, the first exposure and all subsequent exposures, um, and ultimately they end up attacking, causing that exaggerated response. When that exaggerated response occurs, uh, we have what's called a histamine release, and that histamine release really dumps a bunch of fluid into our body. It causes inflammation, swelling, edema. Um, it also takes action to try to prevent that allergen from getting into the body or any additional allergen getting into the body. So the immune response here is meant to protect the body, but in fact it's so overboard, it's so exaggerated that it ends up doing significant amounts of harm. And the way the body looks at it is it says, okay, listen, this allergen is in my body somehow, some way, but I don't know how it got there. So I'm going to take all these protective measures to, to shut down the body to make sure that A, no more allergen gets in, and B, the allergen that's already in me doesn't ever get to the cells and it can't do any damage to the cells. Because ultimately that's what we're trying to protect, right? The cells, the, the fundamental unit of life. So this this theory that the body has that protecting itself um, ends up shutting us down and it puts us into an anaphylactic state of shock in the most severe types of reactions. So, and that's exactly that. There you go. Severe life-threatening reaction, that is anaphylaxis. Uh, any allergic reaction can be mild, moderate, or severe. When it reaches the severe stage and it's to the point that we are hypoperfusing, we are in a state of shock, that would be an anaphylactic reaction. And what ends up happening that causes shock, because we know shock is, is, a, um, is a drop in the blood pressure and it causes a lack of perfusion to the, the tissues, what happens is the allergic reaction causes a dilation of the blood vessels. And the reason it does that is to purposely plummet the blood pressure. The body purposely plummets its own blood pressure because the theory is if the blood pressure drops low enough, then that allergen won't be perfused into the cells and it's a protective measure for the cells. In addition to that, because there's a risk that we inhaled that allergen, the body constricts down the bronchioles so tightly that we're unable to move much air, if any at all. And that blocks it from, again, being inhaled any uh, anymore. 
it starts to swell up the airway to further block things off. In addition to that, we have that histamine release, which causes uh, mucus to dump into the system. We get mucus that dumps into the lungs, mucus that dumps into our, our nose, our eyes start to water. Um, all sorts of those types of things begin to respond, all in an, an attempt to try to identify the allergen and now flush it out. So there's a lot, this exaggerated response takes actions to essentially try to shut the body down to protect itself. Um, unfortunately, if that response goes unchecked, it will uh, lead to death at the end. There's a lot of different common allergens out there, um, food, medications, insects, you know, all sorts of stuff. We don't need to go through those in, in general. I think you should all have a pretty good understanding of some of the more, more common threats that exist. Uh, latex allergies for, for EMS professionals, we know that that exists. I don't know of anybody that's still using latex. Everything is now nitrile gloves, and uh, it does not pose any type of uh, allergy threats. So this is something that's really interesting. A severe reaction often takes place immediately, but can be delayed 30 minutes or more. Mild allergic reaction can rapidly progress to anaphylaxis. So those two bullet points conflict with each other. But what it's saying is that even though the patient starts out okay, just feeling some mild discomfort, it could take theoretically half an hour before that severe response manifests. Conversely, somebody who has just a very mild response and is feeling generally okay could find themselves in an anaphylactic state within a matter of a couple minutes. So these things are really, really um, tricky to, to identify and treat. And even once we've treated them, we have to continuously monitor to make sure that nothing pops up again. So signs and symptoms of an allergic reaction. One of the first things we should start looking for are some of the more basic things, itching and hives. The hives will typically start on the chest. They'll branch out toward the arms. So that's one of the first places we want to look. Um, a general itchiness uh, throughout the entire body. Uh, they could complain of a fullness in their throat as the tongue starts to swell a little bit they may appear flushed and think you know in order to appear flushed that cause or that is caused by the vasodilation in the peripheral vessels and the purpose in vasodilating again is to drop that blood pressure but as those vessels dilate we're sending a bunch of blood out toward the periphery of the body so instead of looking uh, pink warm and dry now the body begins to look very flushed it's going to be very warm okay You'll start to see swelling of different areas of the body. It could be around the, the nose, could be the, the cheeks. Uh, people will start to retain water, and, and you'll see swelling in the hands. It can really be anywhere, and it's, it's different based on every patient. So you see this kid here. Um, he looks relatively flushed, right? There's a, a reddened uh, hue to his skin. It looks like he's probably got some swelling going on over on this side of the face. Um, I would want to right away start looking for the presence of hives. And it looks like he may even have some hives that are starting to work up his neck there. Um, and these are all things that should clue me into the possibility of an allergic reaction. Looking at the legs, there's a prime example of, of that raised red blotchiness. Those are your hives, and those are actually pretty profound. Uh, respiratory signs and symptoms would include that the tightness or fullness in the throat, general complaints of dyspnea, uh, could include a cough as the body tries to expel any allergen that would be in the lungs. Um, you're going to start to get wheezing as the bronchioles constrict down. Uh, strider as the airway, the upper airway begins to swell. And uh, hoarseness as the, the airway, especially the larynx, is swollen up and it makes it very difficult to talk. We also have signs and symptoms related to the cardiac response. The heart rate's going to go up because the, the brain isn't getting perfused adequately, so the brain tries to take that response. And then we have a decreased blood pressure. Now these typically... You know, we, we would increase the heart rate to address the blood pressure. And what happens is the immune response drops the blood pressure, but the brain doesn't like that. So the brain tries to combat that by increasing the heart rate. Um, and it's just a vicious cycle. You have multiple systems within the body competing. So beyond that, generalized findings are, are really uh, related to the histamine release, which are some of the things you see here. The sense of impending doom. It is not unique just to allergic reactions. When patients are truly in critical shape, um, they sense it. And, and they'll tell you, I think I'm going to die. And certainly we have some patients that are just overly dramatic. But generally speaking, when a patient tells you that something's wrong and they're going to die, um, believe them. And we should be, again, very aggressive at treating those patients because those are the ones that are going to be the most severe. As they progress into the state of anaphylaxis, they're progressing into that state of shock. So your signs and symptoms of shock are going to be consistent with most other hypovolemic issues. 
Um, although the patient hasn't necessarily uh, begun to ble bleed out or anything else, they do in fact become hypovolemic. The reason is the body begins to excrete fluids. It increases the GI mobility, it increases urine production, um, it could cause nausea or vomiting, you know, and these are all ways of trying to excrete the allergen that exists within the body. And as a result of that, we have this relative hypovolemia. On top of that, we also have now a vascular issue, right? Our blood vessels have expanded significantly, so we have this high space shock where the amount of uh, space available within the blood vessels cannot be filled by the circulating blood volume. So again, we have this relative hypovolemia. And the signs and symptoms of shock are consistent with hypovolemic shock in any other situation. Increased heart rate, decreased blood pressure, increased respiratory rate, they're going to end up having an altered mental status, etc. The only difference here between an allergic reaction with shock um, and a, a standard hypovolemic shock is going to be initially the skin may present flushed. But even over time, as the shock gets more and more profound and we drop into that decompensated state, uh, the, you'll see the, the skin parameters shift from that, that reddened or flushed look into the pale, cool, and clammy presentation. So the anaphylaxis, again, that is the, the state of shock itself. So assessment of our patient includes uh, just rapidly identifying the potential for that allergic reaction and then coming up with a very aggressive game plan. You know, if it's a mild or moderate reaction and there's no uh, interference with airway, breathing, or circulation, simply administering Benadryl is going to be just fine. Remember that Benadryl is going to be administered uh, at 50 milligrams and an oral tablet. If it is more profound, where we do have respiratory or circulatory involvement, then it may be appropriate to administer the epinephrine. Um, and epinephrine will only be administered in the event that it is a, a more severe reaction. We don't want to give that for our mild or moderate reactions. So how is it that we identify that this could be a reaction? A good sample history, OPQRST, all those things are going to work into it really well. Um, you know, What were you doing when this happened? How long has this been going on? Have you, do you have a history of allergies? Have you eaten anything new? Um, you know, if, if we go in for somebody who's complaining of shortness of breath, fullness in their throat, and uh, they've got hives on their chest, and we're, they're sitting at a Red Lobster, and they say, well, I go to Red Lobster all the time, and I eat shellfish and, and everything, so it can't be an allergic reaction. Well, if it looks like a duck, walks like a duck, sounds like a duck, it's probably a duck, right? So in this case here, they're complaining of shortness of breath, fullness of their throat, and they have hives, and they're just, or they just finished eating shellfish, I'm going to go ahead and chalk it up to the fact that they're probably having an allergic reaction to shellfish, even though they don't have that pre-existing history. We want to get that quick baseline set of vitals, and we want to be able to trend from there. Now, getting vitals should not prevent us from um, administering medications, or at least oxygen. However, we do want to go ahead and at least get a blood pressure to determine whether or not they're truly in that severe state and whether or not epinephrine would be the appropriate treatment at that point. Beyond that, we want to manage the patient's airway and breathing. Now, this is going to be tough because their airway, if it's an anaphylactic response, will start to, to swell up. So we really don't have any options to ma uh, manage a swollen airway. Put the oxygen on them uh, right away, get it on their high flow, and then try to get to that epinephrine right away if that is, in fact, the appropriate treatment. If they have an auto-injector, you can assist them with that. However, in the state of Illinois, you will now be carrying your own epinephrine, and it's not in the form of an auto-injector. You'll actually carry vials of it, and you'll be responsible for drawing up the appropriate dose of medication and administering that intramuscular. Now, one thing we can do when we're talking to the patient about past history is, hey, you know, if this is a known issue, let's say it's, you know, peanuts, they know that they're allergic to peanuts, and we say, you know, have you ever had an anaphylactic response? If they tell you yes, then you can pretty much assume that they're going to have one in the next few minutes. You know, we don't have uh, an uh, anaphylactic response and then all of a sudden get better uh, later on in life. Usually once we have this allergen, it's there for good, and the responses only become uh, worse with time. So prepare for that, uh, initiate that rapid transport, and have that epinephrine available for when the patient does begin to decompensate. If we do administer epinephrine, again, whether it be through our own syringe or through an auto-injector, as with any other medication, we need to continuously reassess and uh, monitor for the potential need for additional doses.
The use of the auto injectors are pretty simple. We'll of course practice those in class along with a lot of time practicing drawing up the actual medications. So with the EpiPens, if they carry an EpiPen, they may have already administered it themselves. Um, if not, you can assist with it. The epinephrine dose through an EpiPen and what your protocols call for are the exact same. And that's 0 0.3 milligrams of epinephrine, 1 to 1,000 for an adult, and 0 0.15 milligrams of epinephrine, 1 to 1,000 for a child. Okay. Uh, again, auto injectors and your protocol doses are the exact same. That epinephrine is a naturally occurring uh, hormone in the body. It's actually a catecholamine that's uh, produced by the adrenal cortex, and it enters into the bloodstream for the purposes of constricting the blood vessels and dilating the, the bronchioles. So our two biggest challenges in uh, an exaggerated response or in an anaphylactic response is going to be the fact that the body itself dilates blood vessels, constricts bronchioles, so the epinephrine is going to do the exact opposite. It's going to now constrict the vessels and dilate the bronchioles. So uh, it's really going to help out with perfusion and respiratory issues there. But again, depending on how much of that allergen is in the body, we may see improvement and then they may decline again. And there may be a need to give subsequent dosages. Uh, the side effects of epinephrine would be the increased heart rate and the increased workload. And that's why we don't just give it all willy-nilly. Just simply because somebody's having a mild response does not necessitate the epinephrine. The potential side effects outweigh the, the benefits there. So we would not administer that unless we absolutely have to. Okay. Uh, as far as actually using the EpiPen, we'll practice that in class. Uh, but again, we'll more so we're going to practice drawing and administering our own epinephrine. Okay. Um, the only other thing that I really want to talk about with this chapter is this here, the adult dose, 0 0.3 milligrams, pediatric dose, 0 0.15 milligrams. You must absolutely know your dosages, okay? Uh, that's it for allergic reactions, short and sweet on this one, and uh, we'll do a lot of hands-on in class.